Rivers? Well, I asked him, please, if he wanted any information about us, if it help, if he would write to me. Is it right to the Associated Press? <laughs> this is not the first thing I've said. I was going to say, I hope you opened up less bluntly. <laughs> that was the thing. Actually, he said it. I let him say it. It would help if we worked that way together. Oh, he, he uh, suggested. Mm -hmm. He says he's committed to a pro co position. It didn't have to be. Well, he suggested it once or twice and told me I didn't have to worry it was going to go through. But he had to do these, make these motions. He gave me quite a oh, 10 or 15 minutes after everybody left the lunch room. Well, you got a list of questions. No, what I want you to do is start from the beginning and tell me about yourself, such as where you were born and grew up and went to school and everything. I've got a fact sheet on that, if you want it. All right, I'll take that then, and we'll start with, uh, you came here from Hawaii, did you not? Yeah, that's right. What country were you with in Hawaii? I was with Honolulu Gas Company over there. What did I do? I was assistant general sales manager. How long have you been there? I went there in May of 52. And you got here in May of 60. Right, May of 60. So that'd be eight years. The first three years I was in the, an affiliate company of the gas company in a refinery, which uh, made butane and asphalt and diesel oils and other refined products and marketed. Now the refinery didn't market but it had a division, the, the company had a division which marketed propane or butane that is. What did you do with that company? That company we had engineered to a point of a major refinery operation. We were going to sell gasoline and aviation I mean, automotive and aviation gasoline and kerosene and all the products that are normally coming out of the refinery. We had everything set and we're trying to get financing for it. The, the, instead of the other refinery was very small. It was a uh, more of a wholesale type operation. The only retail product was the butane that we made. We were set to go, we thought, if we could close the financing for a big refinery when Standard Oil got wind of it. So they just walked in and offered the stockholders about double the stock, the going market price for the stock, shut us down. <laughs> then they went ahead and built the refinery that we were hoping to build. And we, then you went to the Honolulu Gas Company? Actually, uh, I started for that refinery in a laboring capacity. I went there. Uh, from London, England, without a job, just because I wanted uh, to live in Hawaii. What were you doing in London? Uh, I was over there. <laughs> this all goes back. You can't start anywhere with my life. I went to London because uh, my savings for the previous four years were all in sterling. I didn't have any money except in a sterling block country. I had to go to England to go on vacation. <laughs> I couldn't afford a vacation in the States. <laughs> Where did you been? Like, all of your savings was in Spain. In Sumatra and Malaya for four years with U.S. Rubber Company. I see you had a degree in petroleum engineering. Chemical engineering. Chemical engineering. Uh -huh. University of Illinois. Chemical engineering. Uh, what brought you to Alaska? What brought why me to did, Alaska? Why did you come to Alaska? I was um, proposed by the then president of Honolulu Gas Company as a guy who could develop a gas business without any gas. This is before the discovery of natural gas in Alaska. 
Mr. Baldwin had uh, gotten interested in a franchise because he knew there was oil in the vicinity. And usually where there's oil, there probably will be gas, or at least if there's oil, there can be gas. Uh, gas can be synthesized. And we, in Hawaii, had operated all this time without gas. We make gas out of, uh, manuf we manufacture it from oil or we refine propane. The two, one of them is an LPG and the other one is a manufactured gas. And both the processes I had knowledge of as a process engineer for the companies in my early years. I moved from labor to operating to engineering to process engineering to uh, division management then into sales in a top management position. That was the chain of promotions that I had in those years. But anyway, we had knowledge in the islands of how to be in business, in the gas business, without natural gas. And those were the factors which applied when Mr. Baldwin first inquired of his personal friend, Jim Stopford, then president of Honolulu Gas, uh, which led to my being suggested. I didn't know about it. This is all a year or two before I knew anything about the project. Um, and as you know, gas was discovered about the same time the franchise was actually voted on. You were already here by then. Oh, no. No. I didn't even know about Anchorage. That's right. You didn't get here until May 60. Yeah. I didn't even know about it until, like, February of 60. I didn't know one word about it until then. The first job I had Well, I guess the first I knew about it was Stopford asking me if I thought it would be easier to sell natural gas. Of course, I had thought maybe he had in mind bringing it in liquid form to Honolulu, since natural gas is about a fourth the price of the gas we had over there. Well, it would be a lot easier to sell that than it would be <laughs> to sell what we were making. So I said, hell yes. He said, how about up in Alaska? I said, boy, let me have it. He said, you want to go? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> So then he proceeded to tell me that, that there was a natural gas company in Anchorage, Alaska, and looking for somebody to take it from the Articles of Incorporation forward, what it amounted to. And uh, Honolulu Gas Company proposed to do this for Anchorage Natural Gas and got such a contract. <coughs> and it was my job to to do this thing for Honolulu Gas Company. That's why I was sent here as a consultant for Honolulu Gas. On contract? On contract, yeah. Uh, it was attempted to be kept secret. They made me executive vice president of the distribution company, Anchorage Natural Gas, and it was never disclosed, actually. I was a consultant. All the people I hired uh, thought I was it became true. <laughs> when did it become true? I don't remember. It was probably middle of 61, fall of 61, something like that. You'd been here about a year, and then you actually became an officer. No, I was an officer all the time, but it I was still under contract to Honolulu. <laughs> was their contract for just a year then? No, it, was, it envisioned a three-year contract. It was actually to the point where the company is in the is can do without me. <laughs> that was the way it was conceived to begin with. Go there, start it, hire the necessary people, and get a company. Yeah. But we had a lot of trouble. Uh, we didn't get across turning an arm, as you remember, and we spent a lot more money in the starting phases than we expected to, and we had opposition. We. We didn't ever sell gas to Chugach, which was our, one of my first efforts since I came. And so, in my mind, the project was not in shape to leave at the end of, the, say, the, the year. I mean, I could see that the, the initial period had been extended just by virtue of the original definition of the, of the job. And Mr. Baldwin and the directors felt that I should not have any divided allegiance. I should 
be 100% anchorage and no other loyalty. So what happened was they agreed to buy out the unexpired portion of the contract. Is there any objection to this being known now? It I don't think it's necessary to tell all this. You're asking me, and I know... Yeah, I just wonder if uh, there would be any reason for keeping it secret. No. I just don't think it's serving a real good purpose. You intended when you came here then, uh, as far as the public is concerned, to be a permanent part of the... Uh, right. Um, what were some... Now, now, in the beginning, this company was organized Anchorage Gas Company, with the intention of distributing manufactured gas. That, that was at, at the time of incorporation, that's true. And was this gas to be manufactured on uh, I don't think anybody got that far as to where or how they're going to make it. That was going to be my job. If there was oil here, and with oil, it is possible to produce gas. Now, whether the refining would have been done near the oil wells, or whether it would have been done not refining the. This is called a cracking process. I don't know if you ever heard that around oil fields. You have cat crackers. You ever heard of a cat cracker? Well, it's a process by which the large molecules of hydro hydrocarbons are broken down into small ones. The small ones are gas, and the long ones are the longest ones are tar, or coke, not coke, but heavy tars. In between, you've got butane. Heavier is carrot and gasoline, heavier than that is kerosene, heavier than that is diesel oil, heavier than that. And this all progresses by molecular size. Um, I, I was under the impression that they were negotiating with those oil companies to supply them with manufactured gas on the discovery was announced. They may have been. They wouldn't be in the same oil companies, though. Well, of course, you, you can make gas profitably out of... Uh, what's called a pure PS300 bunker oil. And it could, the gas could have been made from imported oil. Now, whether or not the folks that were then thinking of this process had in mind imported oil or native oil, I can't answer. It's easier to do it with, with uh, what you might say, a virgin crude, uh, a, native, a, native, a native oil. Yeah, a native oil would be much easier in the, in the manufacturing process. In uh, the beginning, nobody dreamed then that this um, transmission line, the construction of it, could be as difficult as it turned out to be. Right. That's true. Well, uh, that's right. They expected it to be hard. Well, but not quite that's that right. Hard. A lot of people thought it was a snap people that run pipelines across the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico and other rivers would go out on a calm day and look at turning an arm and it looked like anybody else's river. But this is no good when you had to face the tides and the winds and the ice. It's just not like anything you ever saw before. It looks like a lunar landscape rather than a, anything that anybody ever saw. You've probably noticed the way the pack ice ridges up, makes crazy contours. Has there been any difficulty in uh, maintenance of that line after getting it laid in the line? Well, we have spent a lot of money. I wouldn't say we've had difficulty. This year we haven't spent any money. We've had no difficulty. Uh, part what has caused the difficulty? Sands we haven't had difficulty. We've just spent a lot of money. We've worried about it because of the nature of our company and its obligation to the general public. We have felt that uh, anything as unknown as turning an arm needed to be uh, carefully researched and carefully uh, guarded. So actually you have maintained um a rather <coughs> close scientific research project on That's that true. Line. That's a better expression. What we have attempted to do, it, it's not the maintenance of the pipe, it's the cultivation of the area in which the pipe is, is laid. We've tried to control its surface configuration during winter. And we made excellent progress in 1962, winter 62, 63. Winter 63, 64, we did some good, but not that is the previous year. How do you control the surface configuration? 
we create channels out there which um, serve preferentially to carry the tide water so that the tide itself does not create its own channels through the ice. This is a pretty mammoth type operation when you get out and look at the size of it. And it's done it's pretty ingenious a technique that was developed is to use the tide itself to scour ditches in a preferred uh, location. This is done by driving fence posts every 10 feet, nailing one by six or one by 12 boards along the fence posts. Each year, the last three years, we've installed fences in Turning an Arm, uh, five miles in length. Naturally, this has to be done in low tide can be done only in low tide. You have it literally some places only maybe an hour to work between the tides. <coughs> and this has been successful in uh, channeling the tide? It was a complete success in 1962-63, a moder uh, moderate success in 63-64. And 64-65 we relaxed a little bit because of the general subsidence of the area as a result of earthquake. We thought the effects of the tide would not be so pronounced, and this has come true. We have not had the, the random channel action of the tide that we worried about in previous winters. So we have not spend so much money or work so hard this winter. Now let's like get down to the day of uh, the earthquake. What kind of a day had it been for you? Completely typical days. I remember it was a Friday. And on Fridays we have end of the week type office procedures to go through. But Friday afternoon, we were discussing the need to generate more new business one way or another. And that was what we were discussing when the earthquake struck. Now, it was the end of the day for most of the personnel here. Literally, nearly everybody had gone. It was five and after 5.30. Uh, yeah, it was after 5.30. Uh, you were here with whom? Bill Coker sales manager. So you were in a conference? Yeah. Okay. And Herman Boxtegi, executive vice president. What do you want me to do? Uh, Say what happened? Yeah, wait a minute. First of all, uh, now, now this was on Good Friday. Uh, you didn't have plans to come back to the office over this holiday weekend, did you? I really don't remember what plans we might have had for the weekend. You were just trying to get your conference out of the way so you could get on home to dinner? This, or yes, that would have been normal. That no, what? that would have been the normal thing, just to wind up the day in the week and go home for the weekend. I don't remember any other plans we might have had, but I don't remember any. Now, you and your wife have three children, mm -hmm. right? Are they all three at home? No, the daughter's not here now. Where's she then? Yeah, she was she was working at the Daily News, as a matter of fact, taking classified ads oh. at the time. Uh, okay, what happened then when the earthquake hit? What was your first reaction? I've been so through so many small earthquakes that I, I'm always a little bit amused because I think the other guy's scared and I'm not, see. So this time, I remember grinning. I said, boy, this is kind of good one. We had lots of them in Hawaii, in fact, in Hilo, Hawaii. But it finally got more than I was used to. And I said, I think we ought to get out of here. I remember saying that. And we, three of us, went out the side door and out into the parking lot. And as we left, it got worse and worse and worse. And I can remember the same reactions that 
I've read so many times, my God, it is never going to stop. This was the only thing that kept going through my mind. Where were you going when you got outside? Were you going to the car? No, we just out? wanted to be out of the building because the building was moving enough that things could fall. Had things started falling before you got out? No, nothing had fallen before we left. As a matter of fact, we didn't have much damage, hardly any damage in this building. The light fixtures fell down, but uh, there was no structural damage that I've heard. When you got outside, did you, what, what did you see, the phenomenon of the earthquake, or did you just feel? Well, to me, there was, there was, there were sounds that were otherworldly, especially I remembered, and of course the completely unnerving sensations of the earth tilting. My car slid from one end of the parking lot to the other with the wheels locked. Uh, I remember Bill Coger and Mr. Boxtaggy hanging onto the fence that's in front of the office to, to hold their balance. I never grabbed for the fence, but I had to run. It was like walking a barrel. Have you ever done that as a kid? Yeah. That was the only way you could stand up was to keep moving. You had to outrun the tilt <laughs> or you'd fall. Uh, the most fantastic uh, action of the, of the power poles and, and all that literal ground movement. Of course, we didn't have any brakes, any fissures here. But, and, uh, what real were you good ride. while this was going on? Well, I thought of my wife and kids. Uh, I, I guess that was about equally uh, important to the thought of looking at the ground going this way and this way and every way and knowing what was happening to my gas lines. I just knew there was nothing left anywhere of the gas system. As I watched it go, I could see everything gone. It's just, we're dead, we're finished. Um, Then Can I happened? say any more? Yeah, then, then what happened? Well, it, it eventually stopped. You were here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. it, and, and it took hours, but it was finally <laughs> over. <laughs> then what did you do? First thing I did, as I recall, uh, well, first thing that, that we three of us did was remember that Bill Coger's wife was in the top floor of the Mount McKinley, and he didn't have a car, so Mr. Boxtaggy agreed to take Bill down and see if what had happened. Of course, in my mind, the worst that could have happened was the tall buildings could have been affected. I had no idea that uh, what they call it, the uh, bootlegger's cove, clay was letting things collapse all over the town. And literally from where I stood, there was no damage. There were no power lines down. There was no holes in the street. And, uh, it just seemed like the only thing would have been underground stuff that would To me, it was what was inside the ground that was damaged, not what was above the ground, because there were no buildings damaged. At that moment, I hadn't been back inside. Uh, well, the, the next thing I remember doing was getting in the car to say, well, I better run home. I started to drive away. I got to the road, and I thought, well, now, is this the right thing to do to go home when I know that there must be gas pouring out all over this town. Shouldn't I stay here and maybe decide what to do? So I turned around and I drove back to the back. And I said, oh, hell, I, I can't be here if I ought to go home. And I turned around again and I started to drive out. And then one of the gas company radio trucks drove in, radio cars. It was Ralph Helmer. He said, what do you want me to do? Well, that solved my dilemma. He could go home and check on things. And I could go to the back and see what had happened. Well, that was, that was the first concrete thing. And I remember going back there. Of course, the area, where the building was in darkness. Uh, but with flashlights, we found that the gas was, we were practically out of pressure in the main line in front of the road here, in front of the office, which meant that we had so much breakage that uh, there was no no supply of gas in the town anymore. I guess then is the one of the most desolate feeling I ever had in my life <laughs> set in. Uh, 
somehow I suppose I, uh, I had got a remote hope that well somehow we may still have pressure in the town because to a gas man to run out of pressure is the the end the living end particularly in the winter time you just don't do things like that it's much the same as uh, electric man being out of electricity only with us it's worse because it's harder to restore gas than it is electricity um, I guess the, the you know, not if the pressure was dropping or had it already dropped. the pressure was almost down flat it was we still had maybe 10 or 15 pounds from a normal 30 pounds but it was coming down very quickly so then what did you do well the I think uh, there you was have a, a radio in your car. Yeah, but I didn't turn the radio on. No, I mean a, a, your own portable communication. We have them in most cars. My particular car does not have one. The base station is in the building. Right, and base station's in the building. Well, I think our emergency generator came on. I don't know. We have a standby generator. I guess there must have been a period of. 10 to 15 minutes when all I did was kind of wring my hands. I didn't know what to do, where to turn. I remember the first coherent conversation I got into was with Oscar Thomas, and I said, Oscar, we're going to have to have help, or he said it to me or something. And who is he? He was then the supervisor of distribution in charge of the underground facilities. At any rate, we I presume jointly determined that whatever else we did, the first thing to do was try to get some help from outside because we all we knew that it was more than we could cope with. Well, didn't you have to shut off the valves or something to keep? Oh, I think that we did this first. I think we said immediately we got to have help, and I and I recall that maybe the second conversation was with Bach when he got back with uh, Coger and his wife go somewhere, somehow, and get word to the outside gas companies that we've got to have help. Bring us 30 people at least. We just picked a number out of the air. And I think it was in the course of that conversation that I first heard of where the bad break was. One of the city trucks drove in that had a radio. Larry Eastland was the guy's name and told me that uh, there had been a bad gas break observed in the area of Post Road and 3rd Avenue. Well, this gave us our first clues to where to go. Literally, you've got hundreds of broken lines. You, you don't know where to start. Uh, I guess about this same time, uh, we had dispatched a man to the, what we call the City Gate Station. It is so by built. By radio, you dispatched them away. Yeah, by radio. And I won't take credit for dispatching Perry Johnson, who's still with us, is the, the guy whose specialty is that. Is what? The City Gate Station. Uh, City Gate was Station. Was he here? I don't know where he was. Uh, Perry who? Perry Johnson. He's in the building. I mean, he's around here now, too. A City Gate Station is so designed that it never closes off. At least ours is, and it's common in the gas business to have them that way. The theory is that uh, you can control too much gas, but you don't ever want to be without any in, in the whole town. And I can remember talking with Perry when he made his first contact out there and getting the word to him that there was a major break downtown in what we knew to be our highest pressure line. And the thing to do was to reduce the amount of gas flowing through the city gate station without shutting it off. We didn't shut it off. Uh, we also dispatched a guy, as I recall now, to go to Turnigan Arm to see what happened to the pressure gauges there. We have pressure gauges at Turnigan Arm. It's the only place. Down, really. You mean Potter? Potter. Mm -hmm. and so by reading that gauge, we could tell how we were from Kenai Peninsula up to that point. Uh, Perry had reported in that the pressure was falling on the main line. They have some uh, gauges that, that record the pressure, and that pressure was dropping also. And so for a while, we didn't know but what the main line across the arm or from Kenai was broken. 
we got a radio report back that the pressure was pretty steady at Potter. And naturally, with the valves at the city gate being wide open, that pressure would fall. I mean, if you open a garden that was wide open, the pressure's not going to hold strong very long. Um, although it's different with a garden hose that's 100 miles long than it is with one that's 50 feet long, of course. Um, Do you recall who went to a potter? I believe it was Greg Erickson. It'd be interesting to find out how he got there because the road was closed. That's a good point. I never thought about that until now. Uh, the road had big fissures in it that uh, it was two or three hours before the army went through there and started closing up fissures so they could get troops down there. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Now, when you reduce the pressure coming through, the flow... We reduce the flow. That means flow. we manually close down the valves. We, uh, when we knew there was a break, we had somebody, uh, I think it was Oscar Thomas again, try to get near it. Uh, in the middle of all this confusion, I was trying to sort out where the greatest problems lay. And we had, uh, as I remember, a couple here telling us the Mount McKinley building is full of gas. The Mount McKinley building is full of gas. This was coming in by city radio, by city of Anchorage radio trucks. And a couple finally drove in and was telling me this. And so I was trying to get what few people we had to cover that and the other things that we had going on. We later found out that there was no, no gas leakage in the Mount McKinley building. A propane bottle had fallen over and was leaking inside the building. Uh, but at any rate, when we finally got a chance to look at third and post, which might have been a half an hour after the earthquake stopped, or 45 minutes, uh, we knew then that we had to somehow shut off that line. It would have to be shut off. We had no equipment or no way to control the leak because the 12-inch pipe had broken clear in two. We have a valve in Mountain View that controls the balance of the city. You need to see a map to understand it. Anyway, we, we gave the word to shut that valve in Mountain View. We had people there to do that. And meanwhile, while they were closing it, we had a controlled flow bleeding out. I say bleeding, it was a fountain 100 feet high. <laughs> bleeding out. We had a controlled flow through third and post. No fires, thank God. Um, once we shut the Mountain View block valve, and in doing so, we lost er everything of the town except Mountain View South. We knew that that's what we were doing. But literally, nothing west of that break, third and post, could have had gas anyway, so. Um, The next decision we had to make was whether to shut Mountain View Town off or not. It has its own little system operating from the high side or the upstream side of that valve. And I remember Oscar asking me more than once on the radio, do you want me to shut Mountain View off? Because uh, it had not gone off by itself. There was still gas pressure in the area, but there was odor of gas in the area. And I remember telling him to use his own judgment in the circumstances. I wouldn't have time to get there before trouble would develop. And he said, well, with your concurrence, we'll shut it off. And I said, go ahead. And he did. We shut the town down, Mountain View. Although we still had pressure in the system at the moment we shut it off. But we never did lose areas like City View and uh, Nunaka Valley and all the area, Muldoon and Debar of the hospitals or university and the new subdivisions in that vicinity. We maintained those uh, and directly after we, we got that much under control. We had the valve shut, no, no gas coming out in the streets anymore. Uh, we got all available people to go into Mountain View and relight the gas equipment that had been shut off. This is where the regulators came in 
so handy. Normally, a gas company, if it has to do a relight procedure, must go around to every house and uh, shut the, the individual meters off so that when they turn gas on, it won't be out of control. But in our case, we literally tested the whole town of Mountain View at one time. That same night? That same night, within two or three hours. The individual lockouts... And there were no breaks in Mountain View? There was one or two, and we cut, we shut valves on our mains to do that. But we put pressure back in the whole town of Mountain View. You mean you were able to repair those breaks? We, we, just, that we night didn't night. repair the brakes. <laughs> we had valves such that we could shut out where the where the leak was. If you can imagine. Well, now, wait a minute. Here, I, I know what you're talking about, but you're talking on a main or on a, a service line? Mains. I'm talking mains. If, if this beam mountain view, this area right here, and we have a grid of mains, goes this way and this way, huh? Yeah. Let's say we had a break right there. We shut this valve, or we shut the valve back here that would control that. The rest of the town was good. And we tested the so whole... So you just, oh, you, shut, you might shut off a block. We shut off, yeah, the tail end, whatever was involved. And we repressured this whole town at the central station, which would have been inconceivable for any other company anywhere, because you'd had to go through the whole town and shut every meter off. But we did, we repressured this whole town from this station. Having, having cut this off where the leak was. And all night, Friday night, we were relighting the customers in Mountain View so they had gas again. Uh, what else did we do that night? That was a full night's work. <laughs> we have maybe 1,500 did, customers out there. Did you have an opportunity to survey any of the other damage in the town? We had a guy... Uh, you had to doing make that. at 3 a.m. and you had to have some sort of survey of what uh, your situation was. During the night, we had a guy, um, Chuck Savinsky, who's now with the State Civil Defense Office, just drive around and make notes on a map as to where the big fissures and what the damages were. Uh, we had heard on the radio that Turnigan was all gone and the tidal wave was 70 feet high was coming and all this. Did you hear that? Do you remember? At any rate, Do you live in Turnigan? Mm hmm. Was your house damaged? Yeah. The wall, south wall, the basement. Where in Turnigan? It's barren off. Do you know where Mayor Sherlock lives? Yes. We're about three houses north of him, same side of the road. That's Did your family evacuate that night? Not very voluntarily. <laughs> Bill Coger went and got them after he got his wife, and he said, how about me going after Jeannie? And I said, oh, my God, what'd she do here? We didn't have power. No heat in the building, and, of course, no food or anything. And he said, well, uh, let's deal with you. Uh, Yeah, let him come in. Thank you. Oh, boy, my wife wants to go buy me a car tonight. <laughs> uh, do you have an appointment with Janet about this drink? Oh, Lordy, I better call her and cancel that one. Sorry, Dad. Yeah. Um, will you be able to come down would with you, us? Would you ask Mommy if there's anything else she can do for half an hour, say? She has to go to the doctor at 4.30. Well, why don't you go to the doctor appointment first, and I'll pick you up at 5 o'clock there. How's that? Right. We got our here. Why don't you tell her that I'd like to continue what I'm doing until after the doctor appointment. Okay. And see if that's acceptable. Okay. And if it isn't, come back and tell me. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Barbara? I better call Janet. Well, if, if it's an important appointment, we can finish this. No. I'd rather keep talking to you now. Please. Call, uh... 56201 Broadway. Okay. Janet Archibald. She called. And? Yeah, August 11, 1964. Okay, you got the date. Uh -huh. But but I was supposed to be seeing her at 3.30, and it's now 3.30. Okay. okay. And tell her I'm tied up, and I'll try to make it as soon as I can this she week. She will be there. Have no, not today. I'll oh. try to make it later this week as soon as I can. Okay. And tell her I appreciate the date and all that. Okay, thank you.
and you get the article. Can you arrange somebody to go down and get the, yeah. a ask her th to get a tear sheet of that page, okay. if, if she can, and then send somebody from the sales department down to get it from her. Okay. My family that night went with Coger's wife to the home of Coger's maid, the colored lady. And my family of four spent the night with Coger's wife in a two-room house or so in Fairview. Mm. Actually, she spent two nights there. Uh, what else? Were, what were you asking me? About uh, the uh, survey of damages that night, so you yep. have an idea of what you, was in store for you. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the first thing we had to do was to first thing we had to do was to start with what part of the system was good, in other words, what still had gas in it, and bring gas back toward the town through the undamaged portions of town. And that's what the survey gave us in the, in the night hours, like before midnight. This survey told us where the bad damage was and where we might be able to, to uh, work bypass the brakes and the first decision was to uh, hook on at the intersection of Providence Hospital Road and Lake Otis Road and run a line atop the ground down to effectively Lake Otis and Northern Lights and at that point with gas at that point we could then start working it along Northern Lights because this area wasn't bad hit if you recall. So that was the first. And you were coming into Spinard. Coming into Spinard from, from across this way, more or less directly. See, our normal route is to go all the way to Mountain View and across, and then come out, going south. This way we were coming west and then north. But in the course of this. Now, did you have supplies so that this work could be done? <laughs> we didn't. Normally. You were able to determine that you could make a bypass here. But do you normally keep this kind of uh, we didn't on? we didn't have materials to do a proper job Jeannie. we we had some small pipe three inch diameter and that we could handle oh between a quarter and half a mile uh, and normally when you install gas lines you do it with with welding with two ends of the pipe uh, well I knew we had a supply of what we call quick couplings, dresser couplings, or an expansion joint. I said, we'll use those because we didn't have any welders that night. At the time I decided to build the line, we didn't have anybody, but a few <laughs> a few guys had shown up. One welder was up in Glen Allen or somewhere, and other ones hadn't been heard from. Maybe we had one welder. Anyway, we started building that line, but almost in the process of deciding to build it, we realized that nothing really could get done without power in the town. And so not only should we try to restore the gas system to our individual customers, but we ought to bend every effort, every effort to get gas back to the power plant. And so the next thing was to try to find out uh, what could be done to, to restore that service. And I commissioned a guy to go do that, to make that survey. And while he was gone, I... Who was that? Harold Schmidt. Is he still with you? Yeah, he wrote one of the stories, presented, one of the papers that was presented in California oh, or yeah. somewhere. I read it. Okay. Um, okay, he, you dispatched him to make that survey. Yeah, I remember that. Now, were you out on that, uh, on the site of that Lake Otis bypass line, or were you here at the office or what? Jeannie, I never left the office. <laughs> this is a sad thing to say, I guess. But I never left. for a good administrator. Well, I'm executive has to stand here and make decisions and dispatch people. It seemed to me I was making a decision of one kind or another about every minute on the minute <laughs> until we could get, you know, get people headed in the right directions. And then as they'd come back, there was more decisions. It was 
we did we did a, a full season to work in two weeks is what I'm out to. Uh, I was at the telephone and on the telephone quite a bit of the time that first night. Uh, did your telephone ever go out here? We couldn't call out. We could receive calls coming in. And then you had your... Um, no, it's the other way. We could call out, but we couldn't receive calls coming in that first night. power next. Yeah, I guess that's it. Your switchboard wouldn't ring. Yeah, I think that's right. I must say the phone company got on the ball. Without the phone, we would have been in a lot worse trouble than we were. I don't, maybe we were lucky enough never to, in fact, that's true. We never lost the connection of the phone circuit itself. It never went out. We did lose the power. Yeah, this, the aspect of the thing that permits you to, to use a switchboard or to, uh, well, that was it. The switchboard function that we lost. We we set up our own power supply for that night, Friday night. We used our standby generator and, and some others, put them all together. And they work. This day will feel. Would you go ahead and renew it and send me the bill? No, I'm not. Uh, enclose last year's copy, would you please? Thank you. Um, so you restored your power here with this emergency generator. Yeah. And you had a mobile um, radio system. That was operation. never out of operation. Car to car could always go, all the time. Once you got the generator going here, your base station. Base station, operating. right. So you were able to uh, use the limited phone service and the mobile radio communication uh, to complete a survey of damages and dispatch men and equipment from the nerve center here. Right. That's that's a good summary. Okay. Uh, then when Schmidt decided that this could be done for the city generator, then what happened? Well, we divided the the job. That was a major undertaking. We divided that job into three phases and got it working. The big problem always was trying to get heavy equipment to dig out the broken ends. But in that weather, it was no, was not only that problem, it was one to thaw the ground so the heavy equipment could, could get in to dig. Now, were you trying to tie on where the fissure had broken the main? Yes. Well, why did you have to dig to it? Had the fissure closed? Well, uh... Or you just didn't have a large enough place to work in? You, we didn't have enough place to work. It was just a crack? No, it was more than a crack. I don't know if you ever got to the Third Avenue slide, Third and Post. The pipe, the ground slumped and carried the pipe with it, maybe twenty or thirty feet. And uh, the broken ends were not; they weren't sticking out where you could get a hold of them. If that's what your question oh, yeah. is. Okay. Plus the fact that the what I call a lateral main, it's a smaller main that runs down by the side of Native Service Hospital to the power plant. That line was broken somewhere too. Uh, so we had to get to the power plant through an altogether new route. Some, some we were we didn't have gas closer than three quarters of a mile to it, effectively. Uh, plus the fact that we didn't know how good the line was from the where it obviously had broken back to Mountain View. We had to test that portion. And we had to make new connections around the broken pieces and back into the power plant. And I can remember... Well, now you say you have to break this down into three operations. What do you mean? Well, you'd have to... Dig into it? No, there were three different projects to be done. Let's look at a map, maybe. Uh, maybe I want to get a straight map. Or a system map. This is a street map. Our 
main comes down here, through here. Where's Third Avenue? Can you read? This is Third. Yeah, there's closed. Yeah. There's second, so this would be third. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, there's third right there. Actually, I guess I drew it the wrong one. It's not in there at all. It comes here, this road. All the way over to H Street. Where we've got H. L. This is H right here. That's one point, and down here at Five six alley at uh, would that be Carlock Ingra Ingra and the five six alley. Here's Carlock. Yeah, be right here. This high pressure line feeds central regulating points here, which is like a central transformer station or something, mm -hmm. and here. And the power plant is on Ingra. It's Ingra extension this way. This is the power plant here. Now the brake at third and post is right in here. This is a brake. Um, this line here was out. That's only two locations. But at any rate, our block valve was back here at the wall. <coughs> Lock valve is right here. We shut this, so we had no pressure here. Well, here, uh, we had to somehow tie these broken ends together, and this was about 900 feet, I think, we had to run here to go around this, like this. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's one job to do. This, we had to run completely new. We had to dig a hole here and cut this line off here and cut it off here and come out of the ground here and down to here. All new. Mm -hmm. And then we had to cut this one off. We go up somewhere here, Orca Street, yeah. We had to block this one off because we didn't want to put pressure over the railroad and all that area. We didn't know whether that was any good or not. Maybe there's actually, let's see. Well, we had this location to work here, all of this into the power plant, and this one, and this one. This is about a quarter of a mile. This was 900 feet. But there, these are major undertakings, things that you, we normally work several days on with a full-size crew. And In good weather. Yeah. But remember, all of our available forces once were scheduled. They never got there, but they were scheduled to be working out here, restoring a town, restoring a new line. Now, was this, uh, were these people primarily of your labor force that, well, were, that were dispatched out here to lay this line? The people that could that could work past the meter were working in Mountain View to to a large extent. We put, I think, one welder, and later we got salesmen and guardsmen, people from the military, either guardsmen or soldiers, to move the haul pipe out. Let me give you that. To give a complete the picture. Where is uh, Lake Otis? Right here, isn't it? Where is it? This is Providence Hospital Road. Road. Uh -huh. Okay, we have a gas line coming here, and we have a gas line coming here. We don't have this. This is not connected with the rest of the system. See, our main line from the City Gate Station comes. There's Tudor Road, and we go. Our City Gate Station is right, well, right here. This line that I drew comes up here like this. Mm -hmm. So if we could make this jump from here to here, we could then work gas into the system out in this area, this way. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then basically work it downtown coming this way, where it used to go this way. So you were changing the entire direction of Changing, the yeah. We redesigned the supply. Uh, at any rate, this was a project to dig in here and get the broken ends of the pipe and uh, tie them back together. This was a project. There's two major projects here. Actually, the, maybe the third one was down in the power plant itself to receive this. And this line here we ran across the top of the railroad tracks. 
I remember talking, no, I sent George Thorne down to see the operating manager of the railroad, and I said, we want to put a gas line on top of your railroad tracks. And he got very indignant. Not that we had the audacity to do it, but that we had the timidity to ask him because the whole town was out of power. <laughs> you know, we told him what we wanted. He said, you go back and tell Mr. Teal, be my guest. <laughs> If it'll put town power back in the town. So we did. We ran the line across there. Oh. Uh, this caused a problem a little bit later, didn't it? Yeah. I, did I tell you that story? No, I heard it someplace. Just uh, something about uh, one of your men guarding it, wasn't going to let the train go through or something. Well, I, I can get into that story. But anyway, I'll give you okay, in time sequence a little bit. Uh, this work went on starting during the night of Friday night, as soon as we got a breathing space, I, I started getting Schmidt and we decided that we would do these things here. This was started prior to midnight. Yeah, literally. These were started prior to midnight. Um, the surveys were started and I actually, as a welder came in, I broke away and went back to the back and told him what to build to make this tie-in and this one and this one and this one. And so he spent the whole night, Friday night, from the time he came in, being ready to work with the crews on Saturday. So we had everything ready to go together uh, when people got here. Now, they were already trying to dig down to that before midnight, too. No. Weren't they? We couldn't get a machine to go into this location, uh, as I remember. We actually didn't get going trying to make the excavations until... After 3 o'clock? After that 3 o'clock meeting? And you got electric and the highway department gave you stuff. One gave the machine and the other the point, or whatever they call it. The uh, three o'clock meeting was when? Three that was Saturday morning. <laughs> Saturday three morning. Saturday morning. Well, we knew what we needed by then. Yeah, but I remember you were having, di you, you said you didn't have enough uh, thawer stuff, and we the highway department enough. had the machine, and Chugach Electric had the points or something yeah. to go on it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you weren't, you didn't start digging till after that or had you started trying prior to it? I don't think we tried to dig in the dark. I don't think we did try to dig in the dark. We, what we did was build the above ground lines in the morning of Saturday, morning and afternoon, and we made the tie-in Saturday night and finished Saturday midnight. Mid midnight that was Saturday thing night. That there was some confusion in these other articles. Some of them said Saturday noon, and others said Saturday midnight. You it was Saturday. It was Saturday midnight. Thirty hours from the time of the quake. So we had put this together and this together, and had the turbines running, ready to run again. Um, if you want to go ahead with the story on the on this. Uh, we got the turbines going again, and we're running fairly well until, I think, Monday afternoon. I got a call from, uh, who called me? Oh, the railroad, I guess, was the first one to call me. And they said that the Alaskan Command had to have oil. They were out of oil, and they had to get oil, and the only way to get oil was to go through where the gas line was. So they were going to have to open them up. And I said, oh, no, you can't. I got your permission to put that across. Well, that's right. I said, if you if you open the line, the turbines go down, and my God, we may never get them put back together again. Uh, so finally on the phone, we compromised, and we said to them that if they would build a bridge over the gas line that was over the tracks, the two of us said this on the phone, that'd be all right. Now I'm, now I'm giving them permission to build a bridge on their railroad across my pipe. Uh, so we were agreed, and uh, in the course of the next half a day or something, Oscar Thomas went by and saw what they were starting to do and told him to stop it. He didn't know I'd give him permission. He came back here, and I don't know what I was doing, but he got it to Mr. Boxtegi, the executive vice president. And Boxtegi blew up, said, no, we won't let him do that. And then I finally, I heard about it. I said, yes, I gave permission. So there was a big rhubarb internally here. I said I'd given my word. And 
other people saying it shouldn't be done. So the upshot of it was the two of us, vice presidents then of the company, went down to the location. And in my judgment, the bridge was okay, but in his judgment, it wasn't any good. Well, of the two of us, I'm the engineer, so uh, there was still a, but there were, he was a superior position. So we had a uh, less than agreement at that point. The people, the city police, were trying to do what we wanted. They were there at our request to take care of us. We had requested it. And the military police, and I guess it was the military police, both these guys with guns. <laughs> a city policeman and a military police? Yeah, yeah. And me saying, okay, let them go ahead and finish the bridge and run the trains across. It won't hurt the pipe. And my boss saying, oh, don't, no, they must not. And he was trying to give the orders. Doug McClure can tell you this story very well. Do you know Doug? So finally, they, they argued and wrangled so much that I went out and said, look, if you just get off our backs and leave us alone for 48 hours, we'll build another pipeline and go around the tracks. And that's what we finally did. In time to get oil to the Alaskan command? Yeah. The reason, uh, well, actually it wasn't. It was Texaco. Uh, it had been misrepresented. I didn't know it then. I was I was fighting for the military. I thought, well, God damn it, if the general says he's got to have oil he's, and he can build a bridge, let it go. But we, they finally agreed, reluctantly, that if we could build another pipeline in 48 hours, that they would not run the trains across the little temporary line. You'd have to see this thing to believe it. It was four-inch pipe screwed together with pipe wrenches that had high-pressure gas in it, something that no thinking man would ever do. <laughs> it was, hell, I screwed a few joints of it together myself. Um, you was any a, kind of sealer in the joints? <laughs> I don't think we did. Matter of fact, let them leak. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> that was the only time I left the office was that Saturday afternoon when I wasn't satisfied with the progress they were making. I had to get in and give them a hand to make sure we got it done that night. Because Chirac had told me we were going to be out of oil by midnight. <laughs> you know, they were burning, do you remember that they were burning yeah. oil that they hauled down in army tankers? Mm -hmm. So we were fighting against the midnight deadline. I found out that somebody had been a little conservative because they had enough oil on the hand. When we got done, they ran several hours. <laughs> but at any rate, they were close to the wire. Now then, um, you, uh, we're backing up a little bit, but you sent word out that you needed help. Mm -hmm. Who sent this? How did they get it out? Box Tuggy went to Elmendorf Air Force Base, and I asked him not to leave the message with anybody, but that's all he could do was leave the message. I, I had wanted him to get on the phone and talk to I gave him the presence of three companies whom I know, Cascade. That's in Seattle and, and Washington Natural in Seattle and, and uh, Northwest Natural in Portland. Those three people I wanted the message to go to. They actually got the message, but he was not able to make a direct phone call. The, I don't remember when the response came in. I think the first guy came in on Saturday or Sunday. Sunday morning the first help we got. But that that was only one or two guys. There were other problems that developed now while you were trying to restore gas to the rest of the city, even on a temporary basis. Do you recall any of the any of the incidents that stand out in your mind? Well, the, the biggest one... As either humorous or uh, dramatic or costly or anything. Excuse me, the biggest one was... The biggest one was the break in the pipeline down on the Kenai, which I think we learned about on a Wednesday following earthquake on a Friday. We just thought we had it made, you know, we were getting everybody lined up to work, and we get the report that there is a break in the line on the Kenai Peninsula. And I told you that story about Colonel Joe Rogers. So. Who's this? Yeah, Harry. Pretty good. 
Thank you. Sponsors lined up. Have you got somebody to make the charge? Either he or Scotty. I think Scotty would love to do it. Yeah, or do. Why don't you try Scotty? Uh, you want me to do anything? You want me to do anything? <laughs> no, I, I, I think it could be hit man on delegate, don't you? <laughs> Why don't you take it this time? I'll catch the next one. Okay. And see if you can get Scotty. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, sir. Bye. That, uh... One thing we did, we sent a helicopter for Bob Heath and his family twice, and they came back. Uh, Who were they? Bob Heath is next door, treasurer of the company. Where were they? Yeah. They had started out for a weekend in a cabin down on Kenai Lake. They never got there. Yeah, they did, too. But they got cut off by their bridges being out, you know. We sent uh, Bert Johnson. Johnson Helicopters, you know Bert? Mm -hmm. um, we sent a helicopter to uh, get one of the welders' wives that was stranded up in uh, Glen Allen area, Ted Hunt's wife. Um, when was the first time you saw a bed? I don't remember. Or took a cat nap on the sofa here or anything? I think, let's, let's think now. Uh, not Friday night, not Saturday night. Sunday. I think it probably would have been like midnight Sunday night, maybe, or between midnight and six in the morning. On Monday morning, that is. And it wouldn't have been more than an hour or two hours, I don't reckon. Where did you sleep? On the floor, <laughs> upstairs. Bag or just on the bare floor? Just on the bare floor. <laughs> we, had, we had a sofa up there, but we'd rotated who, who could sleep on it. <laughs> and normally it was somebody there when, when it came to turn. Um, so you got about an hour's nap there on the floor. Was there any particular reason why you woke up? Had a crisis occurred or... Oh, uh, kind of remember now. Monday morning. I think we were breaking out the first cruise. You know, the cruise from outside at six o'clock or five o'clock or something. I think that was literally what happened the, the first time. The reason. Did somebody wait, awaken you, or did yeah. you hear the noise? Do you know Robin Coupe in the back? She used to have the job awaken me. <laughs> and she would literally pour cold water in my face. <laughs> and finally she got to where she wouldn't do it. You fought like a tiger a bit. Huh? Uh, it was hard to wake up. I imagine so after three days without sleep. But they woke you up to get these outside crews dispatched. Well, yeah, to be in on the planning and so forth. Well, that was the routine the first week, was from one to two hours. Uh, maybe longer. I don't remember. Did you sleep here all that time, or yeah. did you ever get home? 
I never, I didn't go home to stay. I went home to take water, and and we converted my my boiler back to gas, <laughs> and I took water in uh, garbage cans. I bought new plastic garbage cans, and I would get out and take the car and get water. From and the family moved back in after two nights out. Yeah, they moved back in to see you said Sunday morning. They spent Friday night, and Saturday night with this Cobra family. Were you at all concerned about them being in Turnigan? Actually not. Uh, it was as good a place as it was, as far as I was concerned. I had never seen the damage out there. Uh, I didn't see that for two full weeks. I didn't get out to the, the slide area. But even at that, uh, there wasn't a very good place for anybody. I didn't think. I, I thought about getting them back to Honolulu more than anything, more than moving them anywhere. But if you recall, everybody was under pretty much hardship hmm. at that time. And our house was warm. We had, actually, except for the fact that you couldn't flush the toilets for two weeks, it was as good as uh, pre quake as far as I was concerned. So you worked here uh, and slept here and everything for about two weeks? About two weeks, I would say. Now, all of this time, you were having to make some pretty tremendous uh, decisions for a young company that yep. still hadn't made a profit. Mm -hmm. True. That must have been a terrible burden at times. Well, we knew we had some insurance, and we knew that whatever we did, we, we couldn't let our public down. At, a, at the time of the earthquake, and we knew that, I knew that the better job we did, the better our future ought to be, literally. Even though, in a sense, our insurance would, might have permitted us not to respond, but to wait and let things work out. Because uh, literally we had what we call uh, business, interruption. business interruption insurance. So if we'd done nothing, we'd still got our normal revenue. Uh, but this is just not the not the way that a company ought to react to its public being out of service. Um, and yet you knew all along that you would get no uh, funds from the federal government or something like the other utilities. But you were doing We this. didn't know for you, a fact. You were risking. That in point of, uh, we knew we were risking. But in point of fact, on a Sunday morning, was it Sunday? Yeah, I think a Sunday morning. There was, I think, eight people from Washington came into my office. I had never been in my office, but it was still here. My office, this room, served as a kind of a Red Cross headquarters for the first two days or so. They picked up people off the road and brought them in, and they were sleeping here in this building and upstairs uh, until they could find, you know get a place to stay. Um, there was quite a number of people from the Corps of Engineers, as I remember, came in and told us that they were that they were fully geared to take over this kind of disaster and do all the restoration. Literally, we didn't have anything to worry about, which I didn't believe a word they were saying, and they didn't really get started for two or three weeks, you know, to do anything. By that time, we were all done. And we, we had most of all of our customers back in that time. Uh, I I would say that I rather uh, expected that there might be help to us through, but it was to me it was something that they had to offer us rather than us to go apply for. Uh, this, I, I don't know if it needs to be on the record, but we were promised this. We, we weren't promised. We were told we are going to do these things for you. This is our function. It's a special branch of the federal government. Office of Emergency Planning. Is that what it was? Yeah. Well, they came in and made They're a lot of... They're the ones that move in under PL 875. Yeah. Well, they came in and made a lot of noise of what they were going to do. And I, I remember telling them, well, uh, if you're going to do all these things, you better get started because they're, they're getting pretty well along. This is only two days after the quake. Well, we'll be here directly. And they did. They, they came along within a week or two 
it must have been at least two weeks before they had anything set up, don't you think? As a as a major utility restoration program. I don't think the no. first water lines in turning in went in for at least ten days after the quake. I don't recall. And uh, they moved okay. the one at my house four times and it froze up every night. <laughs> I think the telephone lines they allowed the uh, army men to move in with start helping out there. And then all of that would be paid for by the OE. Well, they plain told us that they were going to take care of us. Uh, we had already made a bunch of commitments uh, without thought of their help. And as... Well, had it ever occurred to you that you might be uh, jeopardizing money that uh, these other investors had that they wouldn't want you to go this far with? We talked about it a lot. Box to you and I. And, uh, and your feeling was what? My feeling was that, that they have the expense full speed ahead. And I was sustained in that view at a subsequent board meeting, which wasn't, wasn't always evident in, in the course. We had, we had quite a few arguments during the course of the restoration program. But as it turned out, the insurance company, great wonderfully picked up the tab, whatever we did, they, they, this is on us, fellas. They raised our premium, of course. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, this to be public knowledge that all of your losses were covered by insurance, or is this something we should skirt? I would say that the, the lost physical facilities, we have been reimbursed, or we are being, make it that way, we are being reimbursed reimbursed for the, for the direct loss of physical facilities, because this is true. But who's going to give us back the, the business that we lost, Mount McKinley, 1200L, Hillside Apartments and things like that, which, and the fact that the system that we didn't lose has no place to, to serve now. We had, for instance, a lot of gas lines in the in uh, turning the subdivision, some in the area that slid out. Uh, they paid us for what went out in the inlet, but they don't make any retribution to us for the loss of business that we suffer out there. The, the only thing that they gave us was for the period of time that customers could burn gas, except for the fact that there was no gas there for them to burn. And we kept that to an absolute minimum, and that's why they're very happy. They first, they sent a guy here from London that was here three or four days after the quake. Who's your insurance agent? Lloyd's, Lloyd's of, of London. London? Yeah, Lloyd's of London. They sent a guy here. And I can remember he didn't want to talk to me, and I never took time to talk to him. We were too busy. But this made a fine report for them, because uh, they could see being stuck with the business interruption part of it. And literally, they... That bill was only fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, it was negligible. What they was could have been your overall loss? About it was in close to a million dollars. And this is in facilities and lost business. No, the main thing is number one is facilities, but that's not the the biggest dollar item was the cost of restoration. The is that included in this one million? Yeah. A million is, is a little higher. The total is maybe like 850 or something like that. But the biggest item was all this work that we did, you know, running the temporary lines and, and getting a lot of people from outside and whatnot and just working 24 hours a day. They paid all that. The insurance company reimbursed us all the expense of restoring gas service. And then uh, going back and doing permanent restoration? Uh, they, yeah. They paid us for temporary and permanent restoration. They paid us for the abandoned facilities. That was number two item. And number three is they paid us for the business interruption. Uh, that's the way to say it if you're going to write it. Um. One is the cost of emergency and permanent restoration. No, they just make it this way. Cost of restoration. They paid us that. And they paid us the, the loss of uh, for the 
abandonment or loss of, of uh, underground facilities or yeah, facilities. Number three had been this interruption. Is Box Tech still an executive vice president? No, he's he's uh, vice president and treasurer now. He lived here at the time. No, yeah, he did. Yeah, he lived here at the time. Um, when you're president now, are you not? Mm -hmm. And when were you, when did you become president? May 4th. Of this year? Who are some of the other people on your staff that I should interview? Schmidt. You can read his story. It's very well done, I think. Mm -hmm, it is. Uh, There's nothing Willard personal Stump. in it. Willard Stump. Yeah. Gene Fielding. Robin Coupe. What is Gene Fielding? She's leaving us soon. She's uh, Secretary to Willard Stump is her title, I guess. And um, who could be? Well, she's, that's not her name anymore. Just ask for Robin in the back. Talk to any of the workmen yet? No, I haven't. These you ask for staffers. Uh, Bill Coger, have you talked to Bill? I, I wanted you to. I will. Bill okay. took charge of the food service. Yeah, I've got his name for that. How about Will Osborne? Was he here? Yeah, but I don't know what he did. Okay. Um, Perry Johnson, Greg Erickson, Bob Heath. Dennis O'Brien, I guess. Lois Hillman, you ought to talk to her. Who's she? She's Bob Heath's secretary. She's got kids sick at home right now, so you can't get her. Oh, she's the other one in this office mm -hmm. over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was the one you named just before her? Dennis O'Brien. What is he? He's credit manager, office office manager, say. I don't remember what he did either. say he's foreman. That's a better word for it. Foreman and distribution. I shouldn't be picking out people necessarily. Talk to well, as I talk to others, I want to talk to your key personnel first. Yeah. And I haven't met most of them. So I need to know the names to ask them for. Where will I be able to find out things like the Alaska Pipeline and Natural Nat uh, Anchorage, Natural. Anchorage Natural Gas support an annual payrolls of how many dollars? A million dollars. Royalties of so many dollars have been paid to the state government. Bob Heath, you can answer that. Uh, 
Do you know what that client of you knew? He called me and he can tell you. Tell him I asked you to call. What does he got to do with it? He pays the royalties, we don't. Oh. <coughs> they produce the gas. Is that what you're talking about? Production tax? I royalties? Uh, royalties and that and not in the franchise taxes. That you do you pay any royalties or uh, to state government? We of don't. any kind. Uh -huh. This comes from uh, producers. The producers. Yeah. Uh, franchise taxes and the amount of blank have been paid into the coffers of local governments. I can give you that, I think. Near enough. Fifty-seven. Uh, someplace in my notes here, I came across. I everything's at nineteen sixty-four. Can I think of it? Make that a quarter million, and nobody can argue with you. I think. Taxes paid to the city. Oh, that was just to the city, though. Yeah. And you paid some to the PUD. Well, I'm saying all of it together, make a quarter million. And uh, since the beginning, or is this annual? No, no, that's since the beginning. Okay. And we pay a hell of a lot of property taxes. So we. All of our investment in the city is, is taxed as property. That's, that's, and Bob Heath can give you that. You also pay uh, the business tax and things like that. Oh, yeah. So instead of, well, that being property taxes are to the local entity, and then the business tax are state taxes. I think that for the would he be able to give it to me for both corporations? Yeah, I think he will. Uh, Isn't this in uh, what's called brief? No. He just has the word substantial. Yeah, okay. I think it would be better if we bring it down into specifics yeah. so people mm -hmm. can see. Uh, new customers are being added to the system at the rate of about how many a month? Uh, 200. We go as high as 600 some months. But the average is out. Yeah. Still to you. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah. 